I was just sitting here thinking about our first conversation over a year and a half ago when you sat down and you told me what God was stirring in your heart. And to see what God is doing and is continuing to do with someone who will grab hold of what God has a vision for in this city. I, I want to thank you, Michael and Katie. Obviously, we love you guys. We believe in you with everything that we have. Um, just seeing what God is doing through you saying yes and through all of you here at the Becoming Church saying yes, I genuinely believe that the best days for this church lie ahead. I believe that God has given this church a heavenly mandate, and I am so glad that we get to be a small part of what God is doing in this city through the Becoming Church. Come on, can you give yourselves a hand today? Man. On uh, behalf of uh, Pastors Vernon and Pastor Mark, uh, uh, I bring greetings from the Board of Oversight for the Becoming Church. Can I let you know that uh, things are going well? that uh, there is a, a healthy stream that is happening here. And uh, 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 we actually had a board meeting just a few weeks ago, and to hear what God is doing and to hear the vision that God is bringing here uh, through the Becoming Church is exciting. And uh, like I said, I cannot wait to see what God is going to continue to do uh, through you, the people of the Becoming Church. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead today. You can pull them out. Turn to John chapter 14. John chapter 14 and 1 Corinthians 15. Um, and if you want to right now, you can go ahead and take a bathroom break uh, because I haven't preached in a while. So we may be, no, I'm just kidding, we're not, we're not going to do that. <laughs> uh, man, again, it is such an honor to be here. Thank you for asking me to share on Father's Day. Um, it is incredible. And again, to all the fathers uh, here today, uh, it, is a, it is an honor uh, to be with you. I know that there are some fathers here today uh, that aren't necessarily my fleshly fathers, but they are fathers uh, in my life. Uh, Stuart, it is so great to see you here today. Um, thank you for being a father in my life, and thank you for uh, stepping in uh, after my dad passed and just being there, giving me wisdom, praying for me, uh, cheering me on. It is an honor uh, to have you here today with me and uh, to many others that are here as well. Uh, thank you so much uh, for supporting me. And for supporting us um, over the years, it is truly an honor to be here today. Well, in, in prayer and preparation for today, I was praying, okay, God, what do you want me to share here at the Becoming Church, Becoming Church 17 weeks in? Uh, and God is doing something incredible. I think we sense that. I think you can look around this room and see that. And I felt impressed to share a message that I have titled, Seen. Seen. Now, in... In this world, we know that people are desperate for Jesus. And we have been called to be a light to this world. And because of this, the Becoming Church has been called to be a light to this community as well. You see, most people don't even know what they are desperate for today. They, they grapple and they struggle trying to fill their lives with, with, with longings and things that simply don't satisfy not knowing that there is a longing in the human heart that only Christ can fill. And now more than ever, we need to let our lights shine today in this culture and in this moment. We need to be bearers of the hope that only Christ offers as heralds of the gospel, living out the reality of the cross, proclaiming God's love to humanity, and preaching this, that because of Christ's death and resurrection, there is grace for the worst offender and there is spiritual life for those that are dead. That is the message of the gospel. And this morning my prayer is that for each of us, we would recognize that the light of Christ must be seen in and through us and through our lives. And in turn, the light of Christ needs to be seen through the becoming one of the anchor scriptures today is in John 14, and, and this is probably one of the most pivotal scriptures. Sorry, I've, I've got big ears, and uh, the microphone isn't fitting too well right now, so uh, will you give me a little bit of grace? All right, fantastic. It's okay, you can laugh. You can laugh. All right, excellent. Well, we are, uh, we are going to look at John 14, and, and this is probably one of the most important chapters in the New Testament uh, if I was going to pick out one chapter for someone to read in the New Testament, the gospel is clearly laid out in this chapter. And, 
And here, Jesus is sharing a table with his disciples, and he's eating his last meal with them before the cross. And he's preparing them for the future. And they begin to ask him some questions because they aren't really comprehending what Jesus is saying and doing in this moment. And Philip, one of the disciples, makes a statement. He said, if, if, if you just show us the Father, that will be enough for us. And Jesus' response to them is in John 14, 9, and he says this, Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. And then our other anchor scripture from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15, 49. It says, Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Would you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, I pray that over these next few moments, your Holy Spirit will bring revelation to our lives through your word. I pray, God, that we would recognize that you have come to us and you've changed us so that you can be seen through our lives and through this church. We thank you for this today. We open up our hearts to everything that your Holy Spirit has for us, and we ask that we would not leave this place the same way that we came in. It's in your precious and mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, having been in ministry for over 20 years, I have had the opportunity and privilege of interacting with families in different situations. And one of the things that I have always been amazed by is seeing the resemblance in family members, the way that they act and react, the way that they speak, and even the way that they look. Now, maybe some of you have heard this before in, in your life, right? You look just like great uncle Herschel, or, or you look like Auntie Carol, right? You know the one who does the hair? That's a little shout out to Charlie Wilson, if you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> or you're the spitting image of your mama or your daddy when they were young. Have you ever heard anything like that before? Well, this is a picture of me when I was just out of high school. I think we've got it here. Yes. All right, this is a picture of me when we were just out of high school, and uh, this is a picture of my great-grandfather, Clyde P., right? When, when I look at this picture, my wife actually is freaked out by this picture. Uh, we were around the same age, but we're separated by 100 years. Isn't it? I don't know why my mom made me wear that black suit on, uh, uh, on my senior picture. I'm just kidding. That, that isn't me. That, that's me, <laughs> obviously, over here and on the right but when, when, when I look at that, I'm amazed at how even through generations, there can be a family resemblance. He was a, uh, a, a justice of the peace, and he owned a drugstore in Vincennes, Indiana. And my mom says that he was the kindest person that she ever met. And it, that is until she met me. Um, <laughs> but in John 14, the disciples are listening to Christ in this moment, and they are blind to the family resemblance. Philip says, listen, if you just show us the Father, that will be enough for us. They, they had this perception of God that wasn't fully understood or fully formed. And here, Jesus was trying to shift the paradigm. Scripture says that he actually came to reveal the Father. You see, they had this understanding of the God of the Old Testament, the one who had brought them out, and, and, and the God who seemed distant and far away. But here was Christ in the midst of them, shifting the paradigm because he was revealing the true heart of the Father in that moment. The writer of Hebrews says this, that the Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And as we read, Paul confirms that we too will share a family resemblance just as we have borne the image of the Son of Man in dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. So today, Become Church, I want to pose this question to you. 17 weeks in to this thing that God has brought about in this city. When people see you, when people see us, do they see Christ? When we are seen... Are we reflecting the heart and the character of God? Do they see Christ in us? Over the next few minutes, I want to look at three ways. If you're taking notes, 
three ways that Christ can be seen in and through our lives. And I realize there's probably more than three ways. So when Pastor Michael has you come up and preach, you can share more ways. But today we're looking at three. <laughs> right? Because it's Father's Day and my wife made a pound cake. And I plan on tearing into that in just a little bit after I have me some Handel's ice cream too on the way out. <laughs> right? It's clear that there's a heavenly mandate on the becoming church. It's clear that there's a heavenly mandate on each and every one of us to reflect him to the world around us. So what does that look like for us? Three ways that Christ can be seen in us. The first way is this. Christ will be seen in us when we value relationships over rules. Christ will be seen in us and in the becoming church when we value relationship over rules. To, to further clarify, let me say this. We must be people who value grace over judgment. See, it is clear in the life of Christ that he placed value on relationship. He placed high value on people. And most often, it was people on the outside, on the fringes, flawed and broken individuals. Those people that had been judged and outcast and marginalized by the religious of his day. But it was for those very people that he came. And can I tell you, it's for those very people that he still comes today. The message of the cross continues to this very day. And we are bearers of that message. In Matthew's gospel, it records an interaction with Jesus. Matthew 9, starting in verse 10, it says, While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. Now, first... Let me just say something about that. When's the last time you were at a table like that? Some of you would say, well, Pastor Pat, my family reunion. <laughs> Every time I sit down with my family, I'm surrounded by tax collectors and sinners. Listen, we have got to take what God does in here and take it outside of these walls. And I know that's the message of the Becoming Church. But it's time for us to start having people in our lives that need to hear the message of Christ. We can't insulate ourselves in the walls of the church. We've got to break those walls down and go out into the community because that's what God has called us to do. It says when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples. I love how the Pharisees never, ever ask Jesus. But they pull his disciples aside. They say, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said this, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I desire grace, not judgment. I desire relationship, not rules. For I have come to call the righteous, not the righteous, but the sinner. So we see this, that religiously proud people, they value rules over relationship. And they criticized and they attacked Jesus because of the company he kept, the people he hung out with. And, and Jesus was actually bringing light to this in, in, in Matthew 11, where he said, John came neither eating nor drinking, and they said, he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, he's a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by her deeds. How many of you love it when Jesus just drops a bomb, right? He's like, okay, let's just see how this really plays out. Watch the way I live, and you'll see the fruit. I see the fruit of the way you're living. You see, Jesus didn't live up to these man-made rules and standards and expectations. Instead, he was revealing the heart of God and what matters most to the Father in that moment. You see, some people believe this. They believe that being righteous comes from doing the right things. And this is something that the Apostle Paul dealt with in the early church. You see, there was a group of people, they were Jews who had put their faith in Christ, but they also put their faith in the law, and they were called Judaizers. And they were going around telling other Jews and Gentiles that if you really want to be a follower of Christ, you also have to follow the 613 rules of the law of Moses. And they were coming in and telling people that, no, you can't eat this, you can't drink this, you can't do that. You have to wear this, you have to wear that. And the Apostle Paul is dealing with people. And, and in the book of Colossians, he's specifically dealing with them. Right? They, they, they had it broken down to these three categories, diet, day, and dress. 
right? You've got you to eat the right things to please God. You've, you, you can only worship on this certain day to please God, and, and you've got to wear the right things to please God. They actually had something called phylacteries. And what it was, it was a box that they wore on their arm or on their head because there's a scripture in the Psalms that says, I will keep your word before me and on my heart and on my mind daily. So they actually, to brag about how spiritual they were, they would, they would take scriptures and they would write them down and they'd actually wear them in boxes on their arm and on their head. And, and some of them got so massive, they were walking around with huge boxes on their head. And you can look this up. Jesus actually started to make fun of these guys. He was like, look at this. this is, they have no idea what this is or what this means. Right? Aren't you glad we don't deal with any of that today in the church? Right? Except we do. <laughs> Except we do, right? I grew up in a church that said, right, you don't, you don't smoke, drink, or chew, and you certainly don't go with girls that do. <laughs> I broke that mold. Kim, it's great to have you here, baby. Now, she smokes, but it's just because she looks so good. <laughs> it's Father's Day, y'all. I got to prime the pump. <laughs> Listen, right? Oh, do we need to? Oh, man, I'm good. Is this annoying everyone here? This is a fan. If you guys could put this up on this moment specifically right here on social media, that would be amazing. <laughs> right? I, I, I grew up in a denomination where, hey, there were certain things you didn't do. And, and, and that made you holy. And if you were really holy, you went to church on Sunday night, <laughs> all right? Every time the church doors were open, right? And we judged who was holy, right? Because we'd look around and be like, oh, see, Brother Smith is not here tonight, <laughs> right? I'm just a little bit holier than he is, <laughs> right? And this is exactly what Christ and the Apostle Paul are talking about in this moment. The Apostle Paul actually wrote to the Colossians, he's like, listen, don't let anyone try to put these things on you. In Colossians 2, verse 16, it says, Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. It's found in Christ. Now hear me today. Don't go back and say, hey, one of our overseers was saying that morality doesn't matter. Morality does matter. In fact, Jesus Christ actually internalized the law for us. He said it's not what comes out of a man, but he said it's not what goes into a man, but what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. But listen to me, right rules never make you righteous. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. True righteousness doesn't come from doing right things. True righteousness is positional. And it comes from being found in Christ. It comes from a place of grace and mercy. A place that in and of myself, I can never attain. My best could never measure up to what Christ has done for me. And my only response is to accept it and live in it. And then let his Holy Spirit work in my life. You see, it is the righteousness of Christ that we stand in, not in anything that we have done or can do. We're in big trouble. Well, I'm not going to speak for you. I'm in big trouble on Judgment Day if it's the measure is my righteousness, what I've done, how I can live up to it. Right? My only hope is Christ. My only hope is Christ. You see, God never changes people from the outside in. Rather, he always changes people from the inside out. Religion will try to change you from the outside in. you got to look, this, look the right way, look the part, do this, do that. And God says, no, just, just give me a little bit of space, a little bit of seed in your heart, and I'll change the way you live and look and think and act. Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people live. Often right rules conceal a corrupt heart through good behavior. Paul continued with the Colossians. He said, don't let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person 
also, uh, uh, such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen. They are puffed up with their notions uh, uh, by the, or they, are, they are puffed up with idle notions by their spiritual, unspiritual mind. And then he goes on to say in verse 19 that they have lost connection with the head. They have lost connection with the head. You see, when you value rules over relationships, you become unspiritual in your life because your focus is no longer on Christ, right? Your measure isn't Jesus anymore. Your measure now is me. My measure is you. Right? How am I stacking up next to you? Right? We can't live like that. Right? We can't live by judging my walk with Christ by how you are living your walk with Christ. Well, I'm just a little bit holier because I showed up on Sunday night. I'm just a little bit holier because I don't drink or eat that. I'm just a little bit holier because I, I do this, right? No, we can't do that. We can't judge our walk with Christ on anyone else other than Christ. Amen. If you know me, you know that I don't go hiking with people who are more athletic than me. <laughs> Why? Because I know I can't outrun a bear. But I can, I, if I can outrun you, I'm good. Right? So I, I never go hiking with Pastor Michael, right? Because I know <laughs> that bear is savoring the meal to come. <laughs> right? Listen, our measure is Christ. He is the one that, that makes us holy. He's the one who sanctifies. He's the one who brings new life. He alone is that in our lives. Listen, are we living to meet the expectations of insiders? Or are we living to meet the needs of outsiders? Are we trying to impress the people that are in this room? Or are we trying to reach the people that are outside of this room? You see, Jesus was revealing the truth of who God is when he placed value on relationships over rules because he lived to meet the needs of the outsider. Listen, I want to be someone who stands with the sinner. Would it be better if I... Yeah, I'm sorry. Ears, man. It probably would have helped if I washed behind my ears today, too. <laughs> That may have helped. It's a little slick back there. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, right? Are we living to meet the expectations of insiders, or are we living to meet the needs of the outsider? Christ was one who lived for the outsider. I want to be known as someone who stands with the sinner and holds their hand, Instead of a Pharisee standing on my rules, holding a rock. So what are our lives displaying today, becoming church? Are we displaying Christ when they see us? Have they seen him? Christ will be seen in us when we value relationships over rules. Secondly, Christ will be seen in us when we value the individual over the institution. I will. Christ will be seen in us when we value... The individual over the institution. Now hear me. I'm not here to bash the church. I'm not. We are the church. Right? When Holy Spirit was poured out at Pentecost, the church was established. An organism was born, not an organization created. Right? We are the church becoming. And the church is made up of individuals from different backgrounds, different ethnicities, men and women who are united in Christ through the Holy Spirit to display the glory of God to the world. Look around this room, like Pastor Michael said. Look around this room. Take, take a minute, just look around. You wouldn't even find a group like this in line at Disney World. Right? But here we are on a Sunday morning gathered together for the purpose of worshiping him. Why? Because we are the church. And he's doing something incredible and beautiful with the church. Hear me. If the church stops being about people and instead becomes about programs, if it becomes a place where individuals are just seen as expendable cogs in the machine of ministry, 
then we will cease to reflect Christ in our lives. We can't be so focused on the 99 that we don't see the one. In fact, can I tell you, we, the 99, need to be looking for the one because we need to value the individual over the institution. I'm here to tell you, people aren't products or a means to an end, no matter how noble that end may be. Our efforts should not lie in building successful brands. They should lie in building up and loving and discipling people into the church. The church is first an organism, not an organization. Paul wrote this to the Romans in chapter 12 of Romans. He said, as, excuse me, I'm having a hard time seeing here. Uh, I haven't preached in like six months, and apparently my eyesight has greatly diminished. <laughs> as in one body. We have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are in one body and individually members of one another. Yeah. Can I tell you, we are one body yeah. made up of many individuals dependent upon each other. The church is a body, not a business. It's a community, not a corporation. Do we want something from people? Or do we want something for people? Because there is a vast difference, church. It should be clear in the way that we live and love that we're wanting something for you, not something from you. We have to continually be asking ourselves, what is our motivation? What is my motivation? Are we building his kingdom or are we building our brand? Christ will be seen in us when we value relationships over rules, when we value individuals over institutions. And in closing today, I told you, I'll get you out of here. That pound cake's calling on the head. <laughs> Christ will be seen in us when we value significance over success. Christ will be seen in us when we value significance over success. You see, there's a difference between success and significance, church. There are people who believe that they are successful because they have everything that they want. They've added value to themselves. But I believe significance comes when you add value to others. You can't have true success without significance. You see, success puts the focus on me. It's, 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 it's selfish. It's, it's focused on me. But significance puts the focus on others, on those around us. You see, true kingdom significance church is loving people and helping them find the life and purpose they're called to in Christ. I love the tenets of this church. Belong, believe, become. You see, we each have a part in that. You know what your part is? Make people feel like they belong. That's your part. Make people feel like they have a place where they can encounter God. You know what their part is? Believe. Each and every person has to believe. I can't believe for you. You can't believe for them. But if we give them a place and we make them feel like they belong, maybe, maybe they'll respond to the conviction of the Holy Spirit in their life. And they'll believe. They'll make that step. And when they do, do you know who, who takes that next step? Who makes them become something? It's not you. It's not even them. It's God. It's the Holy Spirit. Today, we've been called to make people feel belong, like they belong. We give them an opportunity to believe, and the Holy Spirit makes them become what he's called them to be. We have to value relationship over rules. We have to value the individual over the institution. And we have to value significance over success. You see, the thing is, this doesn't come naturally to us, though, does it? You don't wake up one day, Pastor Michael, and say, I'm significant, right? Maybe you do. 
eh, can I tell you, probably not significant. <laughs> Significance takes us out of our comfort into the uncomfortable territory of serving others and their needs over serving ourselves and our needs. You see, Jesus displayed the definition of true significance by giving his life to serving others. And today, becoming church, we are called to do the same. And when we value significance over success, we will reflect the image of Jesus to the world around us. And when you experience this, nothing else will satisfy. When you move into a space and you see God touch someone's life through your obedience, it'll change the way that you live. John Maxwell said this, successful people are not always significant, but significant people are always successful. Because success in God's kingdom comes through the significance of loving who and how God loves and living so he is clearly seen to others through our lives. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we also bear the image of the man of heaven. Becoming church, when they've seen you, have they seen him? When they see us, do they see him? Today, if you're here and you've been given an opportunity already to give your life to Christ, maybe you walk through these doors and, and you feel like you belong. Man, this is a place. I don't know what it is. Every time I come here, I just feel something. It, it, maybe it's the smile on the face of the people here. Maybe it's, maybe it's their passion. Maybe it's the love I feel between them. But I feel like I belong. That's great. That's incredible. But that's not the purpose. Right? The purpose is to become something, and in between belonging and becoming, there's belief. And today, I can't do it for you. Only you can. There's a Savior who came, and he changed the paradigm of what the Father's heart was. He revealed the true heart of the Father through his sacrifice. He died in my place and in your place, and he rose again so that we could have new life in him. And he simply said this, all you have to do is take my word at it, believe it, and see what I do.